Hello and welcome to our this week's webinar, which is just an open session on post-colonialism in which I hope to answer any questions that you might have. I already have a couple of questions that people sent to me and I will probably start with them, but as we proceed, just let me know if you have any questions, post them in the comments, and I'll be really happy to answer them. And meanwhile, as we are starting, if you cannot hear me or if there are any technical problems you notice, just let me know and I'll try to address them. And so the, uh, those of you who don't know me, of course, I'm Masood Raja, and I am a professor of post-colonial studies. And this channel, of course, is on post-colonialism. It's called Post-Colonial Space. So as always, thank you so much for joining me. So while you get ready to post your questions, I will start with one question that I received last week. And that was about the role of the term neo-Orientalism. And someone asked me, can it be used or what does it mean? So in my experience, neo-Orientalism is mostly being used by Pakistani critics and maybe some Indian critics who point to Pakistanis or Indians writing in English proffering their work to a predominantly Western audience. And they use the term neo-Orientalist there because maybe these authors mobilize certain stereotypes. I disagree with that usage. And the reason I disagree with it is because uh, Orientalism isn't just one person making a statement, right? You should watch our lectures on Edward Said that I just started recording. Orientalism is a discourse, right? If it's a discourse, that means it needs a power structure to thrive in. So when Said talks about Orientalism, what he's saying is that it's not that one or two authors write a certain way. It's because they can be there in the Middle East. They have the power to record it and write about it. And that there is an over-determining field of study that constantly produces knowledge about the Orient and hence the discourse, the speech act that emerges out of it is what Said calls Orientalism. So neo-Orientalism can't really be called neo-Orientalism because it doesn't have that power, right? There are other terms that we can use, exoticism, right, or uh, pandering. But to use the term neo-Orientalism is kind of problematic because it needs to have the power of a discourse behind it, which doesn't really exist. So that was kind of my answer to that. Um, and OK, so. Here's a, a first question. Thank you so much, uh, Ishan. So in migration versus forced, uh, that's a really good question. So that takes us to the question of, you know, diaspora, right? Uh, so a lot of post-colonial scholars, you see, use the term exile, but quite a few of them tend to have really privileged lives in Canada and United States and England. So it's kind of hard to buy into that. But when these privileged people are imagining their exile, the exile isn't that it's materially hurting them. But when you leave your home, if you look different, if you look like this and you're living in Europe, no matter how successful you are, one, you still have this nostalgic view of the place where you came from or your parents came from. And two, um, no matter how much you try to assimilate, right, the identity, your physical identity already places you in a certain category, right? And you have to deal with that. Now, a good book on this topic, on this layers, class-based layers of uh, 
migration or immigration is by Saskia Sassen. Just do a search. Um, I will type her name here. Um, and she is the one, I think according to my reading, who originally uh, theorized these two ends of immigration. The top end, uh, you know, people living in Manhattan, these are doctors, engineers, and lawyers. They come and get, get higher degrees and then settle in United States or Canada. And the lower end of the immigration, which ends up working in the restaurants, in the construction business, and both of them are two completely different experiences. And then on top of that is immigration caused by global conflict. And that experience is completely different because it's an experience of dislocation, experience of crossing the borders, policing, right? So depending on where you are coming from, how you got to the metropolitan cultures will not only define your experience of it, whether you have legal papers or you don't, that will define your experience of it. And then that would particularize what kind of immigration it is, right? But on a larger scale based in ethnic and racial identity, in one way or the other, there are certain experiences, exclusions that will apply to you, no matter whether you came here by yourself or were forced out of your home country and had to move. So that's really a good question. So that's what I think, intentional and forced migration. Now, these things also happen inside the nation states, forced evictions of the people, uh, forced migrations from villages to the city. And in every instance, the experience involves some loss, some gain, but depending on your class, the experience can be completely different. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see if there are any other questions I have. Uh, so while you join me and formulate any other questions, um, there was a question about recently someone wrote an article in a newspaper and my work was used and the question was that uh, what was I trying to point out in my response to that and my, my argument was that when you cite someone okay so there are certain ethics involved in that uh, if you're citing someone in a newspaper even if it is a feature article and not journalistic reporting, first of all, you have the ethical responsibility of sending that article to the person whose work you're citing because it's a newspaper and the article is not being peer reviewed so that that person can tell you, hey, this is not what I meant. Could you add this part of my argument too? Uh, so my point in writing about anything, but especially journalistic writing, when you cite someone, yeah, you can take a slice of their work. And in this case, it was two essays that I had written about the Pakistani English writers. But my last paragraph was cautioning the Pakistani writers in English that, you know, okay, we have read a lot of stories about beheadings and all that stuff. Can you give us something positive? But the reason I was suggesting that was because I was saying whatever you write, it doesn't hit a vacuum. It comes into the metropolitan sphere where there are already stereotypes of Pakistan, stereotypes of Muslims. But in both articles, what I was trying to balance was why is it that the Pakistani readers expect their authors writing in English to represent a better Pakistan? Where does that anxiety come from? And then what are the responsibilities of the writers? The both the articles were trying to find a middle ground. And the reason I objected to the article in the newspaper was because it took that nuance out of my argument. All that writer needed to do, they could have still cited my last paragraph and said, but here is what he is trying to do. So that was my kind of uh, 
teaching moment for myself also, so that when I do something like that, I'm cognizant of that. But if you are citing someone, don't just cite one paragraph that suits your purpose, put their argument in a context and then do it. So that was another question that someone had privately sent to me, and I thought I should answer it. Um, all right, so let's see if, let me refresh and see if there are any other questions. Uh, now on a side note, if you noticed on our uh, channel, I've been constantly producing uh, materials on Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and we have just finished chapter two, so I highly recommend it, especially those of you who teach or are planning to become teachers. And we are also on the way to keep recording uh, Edward Said's Orientalism, which was gonna be a long project, but feel free to suggest anything. And I might need your help in promoting some of these uh, videos. I have also started a playlist on Conrad's Heart of Darkness, and I'll keep building it up from a post-colonial perspective. And it helps a lot if you watch the videos and leave comments so that they get picked up by YouTube and more people can see them. These are some of the things that we I've been doing. Um, now, uh, I'll wait if you have any other questions and, uh, you know, and meanwhile, I look for the, some of the questions that other people had posed. Uh, one of, uh, the subscribers to the channel had suggested that, uh, I should, uh, record some videos in Urdu and I'll try to do that and see how it goes. And then there was a question about, uh, okay, so let me refresh the comments because I think they are not refreshing here. And I'm seeing here, Hina, your question is, how does notion of otherness affect individual or individual's identity? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, I mean, if you go to it through just a dichotomous understanding of reality, and that is that there is me and there is the other, then the answer would be completely different. But if you go through Levinas and Derrida or Ibn Arabi, right, then you already know that the otherness, you know, is already a part of you. The moment I enter the world, the other is a part of me, right? That's what we call alterity, there, this other. So one is to hold myself here and, and to keep the other over there. And I'm not even going into the Lacanian other, right? But a better mode of dealing with otherness would be to understand that that alterity is part of us. In so many ways, it determines us. Right? How does it determine us? If you go to even uh, the question of linguistics, right? So Shorian linguistics, we already know that we become who we know things. We know a sign from its difference from other signs. So if the meaning is not substantial, if it is not inside of me, it's in another sign, then the other isn't just my other. It also determines my identity. Right? So acknowledging that then is crucial to shaping a more complex identity. Um, but by and large, thinking of others as like this extremely other to ourselves, that kind of alterity, I don't think so is practical. It's otherness as part of something that constitutes me, right? How does a self come to be? I mean, there is the internal socialization for which we have psychology, right? And then there is external socialization for which we have culture, right? These two combined make us into who we are. Now, if you go through Freud or Lacan, there are certain things, certain drives that are innate, that are natural. If you come through uh, 
uh, Karen Horney and works of Eric Fromm, then you realize that the tendency to become fully realized human being is part of human nature. All of these things then define the place of the other. One thing that we absolutely must not do to the other is, is what, what we see in the Hegelian dialectic, right? You know, what is the dialectical process? I seek my absolute other. I am a thesis. I seek my antithesis. When I encounter it, what do I, what do, I do? I consume it, right? Sublate it. And then move on to another one, that voracious ego that must reduce the other to understand it. So if you go through Levinas, then you can have a conversation with the other. Uh, can you explain how perceptions of Saeed's Orientalism have changed over time? I heard people make reference to it being poorly aged. Uh, those people would usually be from uh, a conservative side or people who don't really even read his introduction. Um, and if you want to know his response to those people, you should read his afterward. Uh, I think it is aged really well. It was his early work and what he does in that is absolutely brilliant because he was the first American scholar to actually use extensively. And but look, the book comes out in 78. Foucault publishes Madness and Civilization and Discipline and Punish just a few years behind before that. So Said was the first one of the major scholars to use theory of discourse to write about this large discourse over 300 years. Uh, the, the, I don't buy into that argument that it hasn't aged well. It hasn't aged well for people who don't read him carefully. If you want to look at the impact of the book, uh, a book that changed anthropology, the book that changed sociology, a book that changed how everyone in political science does their work. And then in humanities, it, it launched a whole field of study. I think that already speaks for the book. It's not a perfect book. There are a lot of slippages, especially when he goes to explaining latent and uh, uh, manifest Orientalism. But overall, I've read all the critiques coming from the right of Orientalism. Those are pretty thin and they don't even read the introduction carefully. We are doing a whole series on it. So I hope I'll be able to answer some of those questions. Um, but still really interesting. Um, Okay, uh, let me go. Aisha, Aisha. In the present post-colonial context, the conflict between the adopted national identity of migrants with their original is increasing. What do you think? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, okay, so there is a wonderful essay uh, by uh, Benedict Anderson on diaspora nationalism. If I find a copy of it, I will post it, a link to it uh, when I put up the recorded version of this webinar. But what he talks about is that increasingly uh, diaspora communities who live, let's say in Canada, United States or in England, what he noticed is that they increasingly align themselves with more conservative politics back home. And they also fund the more conservative factions. Now, why is that? I mean, I don't know the clear response to that. Probably maybe their return to the national longing where you, they came from is increasingly shaped by maybe what they feel over here in the metropolitan cultures or whatever. But by and large, if these are constituencies, majority of them tend to favor more chauvinistic and nationalistic causes back home. Uh, but the that idea of not even that conservative affinity for the, it's post 1960s, 70s, 80s. Look, we now live in a world where ethnic minorities and other minorities don't just assert their rights to be, right? But there has been a surge in America, in Canada, and elsewhere, instead of assimilation, 
people say we can have both. We can preserve our own culture that we brought over here. And then when we can adopt the culture of the main nation in which we are living. That's why the reactionary responses from the right are always about why don't you speak English, right? And why do you have to maintain your Mexican identity or Pakistani identity? Because what it brings to crisis for those people is this idea that there can be people here dressed like this and they are equally as American as anyone else. I think post 1980s identity politics, but the idea of having multiple identities, right? Um, which was taught to all of us by the civil rights movement, by the, even though the civil rights movement was to become part of the mainstream nation, but the idea of maintaining your own identity and still living here instead of a total assimilation. So there are political and philosophical reasons for that. And depending on that, you take your ethnic pride and you can still be American or you can still be Canadian. Just as in the post colonies itself, if you look at India, I mean, after the uh, states were divided on linguistic lines, you know, people in Kerala, they don't speak much Hindi. Same in Tamil Nadu, but they can claim to be Indians. And uh, so they can have differences. You can be part of a larger nation without effacing the regional, the ethnic, the religious differences. But that's a, another good question. Okay, about the identity. Okay, so this uh, explain about the identity crisis which happened due to colonialism and its impact on poor. That's okay, so here keep in mind that we may we should never make the mistake of assuming that the native identities identities were completely overwritten by the colonizers because what that does is it it offers the natives as this completely passive people what does happen is because of that epistemic and political violence the, the, the progress of native cultures is stymied. So there is no way we can go and retrieve where these cultures would have gone, right? So the people who make this argument that Britain was good for India and Africa because it introduced the railways and the postal system and introduced the English language, um, and this is slightly on the side, but I'll come back to your question. What people don't realize was that if you want to know if Britain was good for India, you don't need the math, right? You don't need to prove that they plundered. No, all you need to ask is that in 1947, I mean, India was one of the richest colonies, okay? When the British leave India, infrastructurally speaking, in terms of what they built, if you look at city of New Delhi and looked at London, infrastructurally, had they developed Delhi on the same lines as London? If not, because they had the absolute power to do so. So if they were there to safeguard Indian interests, they would have built the universities like Oxford and Cambridge. They would have built the cities. The sewage system would have been perfect. It's because India had resources to build that, right? But they didn't do that. So when they leave, those infrastructural inequalities are already there and we are just playing catch up. That happens in every colony. Right? So it's not just that the local identities, political identities and their progression into modernity is stymied. It's that because of those 200 years here, 300 years over there, the material infrastructures do not develop, but also the intellectual inf infrastructures do not develop. There's a beautiful book by Achille Mamembe called On the Post Colony in which he describes that if for 150 years you did not learn the habits of democracy, which their European counterparts were already practicing, how do you expect people to learn it in 35 years or 30 years? That's why these countries that are successful democracies, you know, um, 
like India, like Bangladesh now, they are miracles because they were able to build democratic systems. So um, what happens is the identities become hybrid, right? So maybe, of course, that's a good thing. But on the other hand, the class structure remains the same, the rural urban divide within that, if you're in India, the caste differences, if you're in Pakistan, Bangladesh, the regional inequalities. And because of that, you know, what comes out of that is this stratified culture in which there are the top echelons, right, who are still in sympathy with their European counterparts. And then there is the people who tend to be poor and divided on religion. One other thing that happened to social identities under colonialism was that the ethnic differences and, and sectarian differences and religion, religious differences get heightened because of the policies. And those are all the consequences of colonialism. I hope I did answer your question. Future of, uh, I don't know what you mean the future of the, Okay, so there are a lot of reactionary people here who tell us post-colonialism is over. I have a student to whom one professor once said that all that needed to be said about post-colonialism has already been said. The problem with that criticism is that they, they, this is a straw man argument. These people assume post-colonialism to be a certain thing and then say that the need for that is over. That's the beauty of this field of study. It's voracious. It appropriates things from other fields. How did post-colonialism come to be? We appropriated materials from African-American studies, from feminist studies, from Marxism, from gender studies, from studies of colonial history, studies of globalization. For as long as there are issues of inequality, global or internal, post-colonial studies will always be relevant. If you want to be a post-structuralist, fine. If you want to be a Marxist, fine. If you want to be like Spivak and be a Marxist, feminist, deconstructionist, post-structuralist, that's fine too. So uh, maybe in institutional terms, the institutions would stop hiring more post-colonialists and that has already happened. But in terms of the work that we can do as post-colonialists, there is endless for as long as there is injustice in the world, you know, we can always find something new to write about. Uh, okay, comparative study of black skin, white masks by Fanon. The, I haven't read Dabashi, it's uh, over there, but um, I would hazard an opinion is that what Fanon is doing Black skin, white masks was a deeply, deeply uh, informed work through psychoanalysis. I mean, like the basic argument is that when the when the black human subject male makes the transition through the Oedipus complex, right, and you are following the law of the father. Instead of his real father, he sees the colonial master. And what are the implications of that? You can apply that to any ethnicity, any group. And of course, there are critiques of that as well. So uh, sadly, I haven't read Hamid Dabashi's work on it. But uh, on Fanon, I just recently recorded one on uh, the conclusion of black skin, white masks and one on how not to misread early Fanon without reading the later Fanon. So you can probably watch those videos. Uh, say about black skin, talking about reorientalism, although not ex Okay, so Aisha, in a negative... Okay, so what I'm saying is that yes, they are doing that. That was my argument in two of my articles. But we don't need to call it reorientalism because that weakens our argument, right? We can call it, you know, anything, misrepresentation or uh, exoticization. My argument comes from 
Ajaz Ahmed's, right, in theory, where he talks about that in post-colonial studies, there are certain tropes that are expected. There has to be a story of a dictator, right? Uh, now, all of these ills do exist in these post-colonial countries. But my point was that when you proffer these stories to a metropolitan audience, it's over-determined by the publishing industry. I mean, think of it this way. I have the issue of Granta on Pakistani fiction sitting on my shelf. And these are authors who have been invited to give their stories, right? So I wrote about uh, the, the main story, which was, I think, Laila in Wilderness, right? And what I pointed to that was that by not naming a place, the setting is not named, right? What that story ends up representing is this abstract place called Pakistan and the things that happen in there then can one, a reader could extrapolate that this happens all over Pakistan, right? And that's the danger, a reader who is not well informed, right? So I agree with that. All I'm saying is that instead of using reorientalism, which technically it is not, we could use any other terms to, um, to, to indict this proffering of the stereotypes to the metropolitan. That's why I like Uzma Aslam Khan's books. I mean, I'm not saying people should write hagiographic works about Pakistan and India. No, there has to be a critique of power, absolutely. But there has to be some love in it too, right? Of the people, of the land. And um, so in the Granta issue, Mohsen Hamid's story is called a beheading. Brilliant story. Formalistically, it's beautiful. But why would you just write about this thing in an issue that is going to represent Pakistan? But also, another thing is emerging. If you go and read the reviews of these novels, what ends up happening is this idea in reviews, especially in a uh, uh, consumer reviews, is that the authors themselves become heroes because the stories that they are writing represent such a dark and dismal picture of their native countries that the reader is like, well, you know, look, he made it. I mean, look at the kind of against this backdrop of non-creativity and all. So, so the cult of that kind of representation, it's a very complicated topic, but still I agree that whatever people from the global periphery write, it's slightly overdetermined by the demands of the metropolitan market, the publishing industry and all. And two, it doesn't hit a vacuum. It hits a world in which certain things about these cultures are already internalized by a lot of audiences, especially if you're writing a popular novel. That is why the topic of my next book, which I hope will come out next year, uh, and that doesn't deal with Pakistan or post-colonialism, but it deals with representations of Muslims, is that, is how to train our students to read these texts differently, but how to also question the representation itself, not simply from a point of view of it's not authentic, but from the point of view of what these works do in the world. Okay. Uh, Rabia Jamil, post-colonial nations and people the decolonization, but I believe colonial nation damages a person. Absolutely. I mean, that trauma is always there, not just necessarily physical trauma. What it does is, um, if you have read Chen Weizhu, right, um, part of his argument I don't agree with. First of all, it creates different classes. So he calls the post-colonial elite as the aerials, right, and rest of us as the Calibans. So first of all, there is class stratification in which there is a Europeanized core which inherits the nation in a way. And then there are the people who, who never had access to education or any other means of upward mobility. Those hierarchies are inherited. 
Then within the class system, there are different hierarchies of color, right? Aesthetics, uh, just how you speak your English. In Pakistan, um, I don't know about India, but in Pakistan, like people would just chastise you for your English accent because you have a Pendu accent. You, you don't have the accent of the elite school. So all of these problems, now, the point is that these problems would have existed even if the colonization had not happened, but they would have been different problems, right? These were problems of imposition of the foreign educational system. So psychologically, absolutely, when you reshape a culture's aesthetic, right? Uh, just the hierarchy of pigmentation. I mean, India, Pakistan. Now, if you are in South India, you'll be fine, right? But in Northern India and Pakistan, we know that our people have different colors, right? Different kind of pigmentation, but a certain one is privileged, right? Especially when it comes to marriages, especially for women, right? All of that, you know, where did it come from? Like we didn't wake up one day and assume that people who have lighter color are better or more beautiful. That aesthetic was reshaped through colonialism. So I agree, yes. The question is, what do we do about it? Of course, we try to change our culture. We try to write about it, teach it differently. Uh, OK, good. So Muhammad Imran, can you elucidate on the notion of difference between the policies of colonization in different colonies especially in Asia and Af Africa, like they carried out it in a different way. Absolutely. Okay, so the one major difference was uh, between the French model and the British model. Okay, and uh, of all the people, Robert Young does a really good discussion of it in his book on post-colonialism. So the French model still was paternalistic, but the French I mean, their biggest experience was in Algeria, right? So in Algeria, the settler French actually consider themselves Algerian, build their communities. There's still a division between Arabs and French, but French believed in the power of their culture to change the natives into Frenchmen. The British, on the other hand, maintained their Britishness. They built their colonial spaces separate from the natives, right? They, you can still see them. Uh, you have the cantonment areas in India and Pakistan. Those cantonment areas were for the British subjects, right? For the British administrators. And then there would be the town. We still have maintained that division. Now, uh, these two philosophical models are what um, Young defines as the Hegelian model and the Bergsonian model, right? Henri Bergson, the French philosopher. Now, the Hegelian model of the master slave, right? Um, or the Hegelian view of the natives is that they are less than human, right? And, and they needed to be controlled through brute force kept under control, because if you don't, they will rise. The Bergsonian model was where natives were imagined to be childlike, right? Like the noble savage. And if they were imagined to be childlike, then you could train them and make them a part of the dominant culture. So these were the two philosophical connotations of colonialism. And then the French model probably allowed more assimilation and to a certain extent, mixing of the cultures. The British model relied on law, education, but maintained a strict difference between the colonizers and the colonized, and certainly not the mixing of races. So these were the two major 19th, 20th century colonialist models. Now, if you go early, pre-capitalistic colonizations, right, 17th century and others, uh, another, Amazing example is uh, Argentina. And uh, Gilberto Freire has a wonderful book on it. 
it's called miscegenation. Argentina and Brazil, uh, the Portuguese colonization of Argentina was interesting because they allowed miscegenation. They allowed the colonizing Europeans to mix with the native cultures and just produce the mestizo and the mixed races. And so that was a completely different model that necessarily wasn't followed by the British or by the French, uh, even by the settler French in Algeria. So these are some of the ways in which colonial administration was administered. Now the end result was the same. You know, colo um, the colonialism was justified under the register of ci a civilizing mission. We are bringing light to the heathens or a Christianizing mission. We are bringing Christian light to these regions. But the basic motive, of course, was financial and economic, right? Uh, now, how did they do that? Also differed, you know, did they invest anything in the countries? Yes, they did. But these were extracting missions, right? I mean, look at the British enterprises. They were run by what? What was East India Company or the Hudson Bay Company, right? These were private corporations given the charter by the monarch to go and exploit the resources of these places. So the British came to India, you know, not to bring light to the people, but as a corporation for profit, right? But then religion and empire play a role in it. Um, so let's just keep that in mind. Okay. So my query is about your opinion on decolonization and the ways and importance. Okay, so decolonization is of different varieties. First is the physical decolonization, right? So of course, like my opinion is absolutely, man, you know, that needed to be done. We needed to throw these people out of wherever we lived. The other is decolonization as theory, decolonial thought. Right, and that comes from Walter Manuel. Right, uh, I've read Walter Manuel, and I've read the idea of decolonial thinking. I think it's absolutely necessary to develop epistemic ways of arguing a point which use um, local philosophies, local cosmological understanding, but we should also not be reluctant to borrow from any culture. May it be a culture of our colonizers and bend it to our use. Uh, there is a famous line, I think, from a movie, you know, where someone says, you know, you can't destroy the house of your master with the tools of your master. And someone says, you know, just give me a hammer and I'll show you that. So physical decolonization, absolutely. It followed different patterns. India and Pakistan negotiated their freedom. Algerians lost about a million and a half people in their struggle. The African nations, different ways of winning their freedom. And now a lot of people say, well, what did they do after that? Well, it's just like people blaming, blaming African Americans for not succeeding after emancipation. When you are freed by a decree or when you win your freedom, you're still caught within the larger economic structures. Unless those are changed, you're still struggling against the same powers. I mean, that's why Ungugi Chiango's Devil on the Cross is a great novel, because what it tells you is that even after the nation is free, its elite is still working against the interest of the people because they are now beholden, beholden to global corporations. So decolonization, but a kind of decolonization in which what is absolutely acknowledged is that it will succeed only if the global order of economics is also changed. Now that was happening in the 1970s in United Nations when the developing nations had formed a huge constituency and they had started challenging the established order. But eventually by 1980s, the General Assembly was defanged and all the decisions are now, all the decisions that they, that matter are, you know, decided by the permanent members in the Security Council. So that revolutionary potential of the developing world has also been lost. 
Okay, so that's a really great topic. So the colonization of South America in the boom novels, especially Garcia Marquez, but also the struggle, you know, of of Simon uh, Simon Bolivar, right, of liberation of South America. It's not just the colonizations of uh, South America. The reason we post-colonialists, some of us, of course, do. I don't have the expertise in it. We don't do a lot of South American text is because there is a whole field of study called Latin American studies. And our friends and colleagues who do that, they still use Saeed and others. And we use their scholars, right? We use Jose Marti and all the other people. Um, uh, but uh, it is a subject, and it actually on decolonial studies, people like Walter Manuolo and others, a lot of critical thought is coming from there. Also critiques of globalization, neoliberalism are also coming from South America because that's where these policies were implemented first in the 1970s. Um, and that of French, I don't know the specifics of French colonization in, in Asia, but in post-colonial studies, depending on your specialization, they are absolutely uh, you know, worthy of your study, right? And when you do French colonialism or Italian in Libya or others, then you will have to look at the particularities of their policies, how they ran it, how were the freedom struggles fought against them, depending on which territory was colonized and which European power was colonizing in that territory, it would depend on their archive, the response, and would be very particular to that particular imperial power and the resistance against it. Yes, uh, okay, let me see, I'm losing. Nationalist movements, right? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, if you look at, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with your uh, particular example, but if you look at the African freedom struggles, right? So what becomes Mali and Senegal, the original claim by Senor and others was they wanted to create a United States of Africa, a coalition of different nations to gain their freedom. But at that time, the frame of struggle was nationalistic. So that's what they ended up doing. Now, if you look at India, for example, and the reason I keep going through Indian, Indian and Pakistani materials is not because I prefer them over the others, because that's what I know a little bit more about. The initial fight until 19, mid 1930s, the Muslim conference, Indian National Congress, Muslim League, was all about a confederacy. The main question was, some people wanted a strong center and weak provinces, and some people wanted autonomous provinces with a weak center. But until the late 1930s, the fight was all about a confederacy of states, even the Muslim dominant areas. So. So in most cases, the reason freedom struggles become nationalistic, I think, was because that was the frame in which the fight needed to be fought. And now Fanon in Wretched of the Earth actually has two essays on the need for that, because his idea was that we first need to create a national space which is free and then build larger pan-African organizations on that. Well, uh, Conrad meant to reveal Africans in his heart of, but in a way he's marring the white superiority to how is he taken by European critics for, well, I mean, uh, part of Heart of Darkness is absolutely critical of what is happening in Congo. 
And Marlowe as a narrator is an interesting narrator because he makes fun of things, right? He's ironic. But the way Conrad sets it up is by creating Congo as a special case, which it was, right? Remember, the first sentences of Marlowe are what saves us is the efficiency, the idea, right? And the idea is that imperialist idea, right? So the way Conrad criticizes the Europeans and their actions is by juxtaposing their brutality, right, within the context of Congo and by pointing to the Dutch, right? But at the, in the backdrop, what's his defense is that the British do it more efficiently and they have more organized systems. Now, do keep in mind that both uh, Conrad had gone there for his research. He had also met Roger Casement, who in 1904, I think, publishes the Casement Report, which was crucial in deciding to take Congo away from Leopold II. And they meet. They were both idealists. They wanted to see what colonialism can do for Africa. But they, 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 when, once they see what was happening, they kind of lost faith in it. So part of it comes across. And I've, I've never read Heart of Darkness simply as an ill-informed European text. I mean, there are still racist things in it. But part of it is a critique of what was happening in Congo. And, you know, we all need to acknowledge that. Um, okay, can you, okay, so our literary productions, which, well, I mean, re, uh, I think you had posted this last week to resistance literature, any literature, you know, colonial or post-colonial, which talks about, you know, issues of speaking against power is resistance literature. But I had pulled out this book after you left that comment. And it's by Barbara Harlow. This was one of the first major works which goes and traces the role of narrative resistance literature uh, in Arab writing and all the other writings. I think this book came out in 1977. I could be wrong. 1987. So do take a look uh, at Barbara Harlow. But there are texts that can be mobilized to talk about material resistance. I have a video on uh, Osman Sembain's novel about a, uh, you know, strike, which is resistance literature. There can be acts of semiotic resistance where people wrote tracts against the colonial powers. If you are in India, if you want to write about resistance literature, 1888 is when Queen Victoria, uh, 1858 is when Queen Victoria issues the proclamation and becomes Empress of India. The same year, Hazrat Mahal of Awadh, the Queen of Lucknow, Awadh, had also issued a counter proclamation in which she questions Victoria's right to claim, you know, the monarchy of India. That's resistance literature. Anytime you see, you read a text, that offers anything semiotically in opposition to the dominant assertions on, about anything, it's resistance literature. So depending on what you are deciding is resistance, becomes resistance literature, right? It can be about a movement, a political movement. It can be about overthrowing your masters. And it can be challenging an established dominant norm. All of that falls into the category of resistance literature. But if you really want someone's early argument on what was considered resistance literature, Barbara Harlow's book, Resistance Literature, kind of started the conversation within the Arab and other contexts. Poetry, if you are in Pakistan, any poetry, Faz, Habib Jalib, right? Famida Riaz. Kishwar Nahid, all of that is resistant literature, some against patriarchy, some against the military rulers. Anytime someone writes something that criticizes power, 
it is resistance literature. Or, but, I mean, there are certain qualifications too, right? You yourself either have to be in solidarity with the resistance group or be part of the resistance or be, you know, in, in sympathy with someone who's fighting oppression. So there are certain qualifications. Uh, okay, Moham, is being done as a result of wars invading us? I, I don't get this question, Mohammed. You will have to uh, amplify that. Kate, thank you. Do you think sacred religious texts can be resistance literature or are they the opposite? No, absolutely. Uh, if you look at liberation theology in South America, right? So liberation theologists are mostly Catholic priests. They are reading the same Bible and scripture, but they are mobilizing it for alleviation of poverty and for fighting against corruption. Right. So the same Bible, which, you know, the dollar people will read as a gospel of prosperity, someone who believes in the poor and believes that Jesus would take care of the poor mobilizes the same Bible against oppression, against poverty. Similarly, the readings of the Hindu scriptures, right? Some people read it to say, well, Brahmins are on the top, right? But when B.R. Ambedkar re goes and reads it, he is like, no, what about the people over here? So religious texts, by and large, depending on who mobilizes them, can be oppressive texts in their practices, but can be liberating texts. Now, if you look at East Germany, right, before the bringing down of the wall, right? The church in East Germany was a revolutionary institution. Why? Because religion was banned, right? So since religion was banned, people who met secretly to worship were the ones who were opposing the communist regime. I mean, that's the tradition that the Christian Democrats come from, right? The the greatest leader in Europe, you know, Angela Merkel comes from that traditions of, of the church. So depending on who mobilizes them and for what purpose, religious texts can be effective resistance texts. Absolutely. Uh, you know. Okay, so I'm trying to go through more uh, Um, I think I've answered all the questions. Uh, if you see that I didn't answer it, if you could post it again, I'll be happy to take it on. Now, uh, while you are doing that, so please do keep in mind that there are two new series being developed on the channel. One is on Edward Said. So we are reading... Uh, hopefully, uh, I hope, uh, Saeed World to World, starting with the introduction and talking about it. And then the series on Paulo Freire, right, is uh, we've already finished chapter two and all those uh, conversations are available on the channel and I'll pretty soon start uh, chapter three. I have also tried trying to develop a, a series on Heart of Darkness with the post-colonial perspective. So please do watch those and send me your suggestions. Uh, but that is what uh, I'm doing just in terms of the post-colonial space channel. Uh, there are a lot of resources which I am developing for my fall classes and I'm sharing also if you need to use them for any of your classes, of course, you're free to use them. Uh, okay, so Mohammed, what was the first part of your question? Okay, can you, okay, I got it. Can you relate the other movements like existentialism, absurdism and other pessimists as a part of politicized manipulation, like making the people to show contentment over, uh, yes, uh, yes and no. Um, yes, if they have a massive appeal, 
right? So the influence would be depend depending on where do you want to track it. So if these are existentialism, if these are other pessimistic movements, maybe the influence will be on the intelligentsia, on the educated lot. And then maybe it will percolate downwards. So then, yes, they have an influence. Now, if they are popularized and people buy into it, that kind of pessimism, then they would have a larger impact, right? Because then people will become passive and dejected. But we don't need existentialism and pessimism for people to be dejected. There are material conditions already that force people to just, you know, wipe their noses and just try to stay out of trouble. And that is the brutality of a system in which there are no protections. And it doesn't just happen to the poor. How do we keep our American students docile, right? And in their classrooms and not on the streets, right? We trap them into the government debt from the very start since education is so expensive. All of them take out loans. And then we trap them in private debt. At 18, they start using their credit cards, right? So what is in their best interest then? To go out in the street and fight injustice or to say, I better get a job so that I can pay this credit card and I can pay my student loan, right? But it's not just happening to one people, right? Millions of Americans owe money to the government. The student debt is $1 trillion, right? That is another way of keeping people passive. So philosophies alone don't make us passive or silenced. The material conditions can be produced to do exactly that. Uh, but yes, you can, you can pick up any artistic movement and see what its impact is, but you'll have to trace it in the intelligentsia and intellectuals first because they're the ones reading it. And then how do they practice it downwards? Maybe if you're a professor, it would impact your teaching. Just as if I read Paulo Freire, I have to kind of shape my teaching accordingly. So similarly, you know, if I've read Sartre and others, that will shape my teaching. But if you have read too much of Camus without understanding it, what will I do with that? So yes, that impact will be there. And it can sometimes permeate the culture itself, the politics itself, depending on. So I'm going to conclude here. Uh, and while you, if you have any last minute questions, uh, by uh, first of all, thanking you all for joining me. And uh, please also invite others to join us, you know, every Saturday, if, if you are free. <laughs> That's the only time that I can make it at a time when it is feasible for people in the North Americas, Europe, as well as South Asia, where I'm originally from. This time, that's why it's crucial. Um, but I'm grateful that you all have joined me. And uh, if I missed anyone's question, you can always send it to me. Now, this webinar will be available in this form through the link that you used. But I will also edit it and re-upload it as an edited version. And so that will be accessible to you uh, through an open link on the channel. That's all I have today. Thank you so much for joining me. And, you know, if you have any questions, any suggestions, let me know. We have not decided the topic for the next week, but I will come up with something and uh, let you all know. So have a wonderful day or a wonderful evening. And... I will see you next week and until then, peace and love.